up something that's interesting is that, you know, setting our mind on the flesh or setting our mind on the spirit, right? Yeah. And this idea of carnal Christianity. Or you could say American Christianity <laughs> in some cases. You said it this time, not me. I, hey, you know. But, but, but it is true, right? I mean, it's specifically in our society today where it's, I feel this way. Yeah. I identify this way. Jesus is a God of love. You're right. He is. But he also called sinners to repent. My, my parents, I knew, loved me. Right. But yet there were times whenever I messed up, mm -hmm. I had to get punished for it. And that deepened the love because they had set boundaries for me. And I knew where those boundaries were. And I knew there was a penalty if I crossed that boundary. Do you think it goes too far to ask the question of like, is a God worth serving that doesn't require transformation? Is that like too far of a question to ask? No. Because like I sit here and think you know, American Christianity, society and all that. It's like me and God are good because I choose to do this and, you know, whatever. But it's like, no, you're not. Like not not the God of the Bible. No. Like, and if if that's who you want to be good with, then there are certain things that you need to transform. Well, and whenever you look at everything that He's done for us, I mean, just the very fact that He sacrificed His Son, mm -hmm. and you're just going to be like, yeah, that's cool, God. You know, okay, so I'm going to go off and do whatever I want. Thanks, bye. Yeah. N no. Yeah. You're. <laughs> Whenever somebody gives me a gift like that, mm -hmm. I'm going to do what they ask me to do. Which, again, that kind of goes back to what we've been hearing about in James, where it's, you know, what is it? Uh, show me, you know, your, your you know, the faith yeah. and the mm -hmm. works, and, and I'm going to get it all convoluted around. But you say, I have faith. Yeah. You know, I say, I have work. Right. Show me your faith, and I'll show you. Yeah. Yeah. So. Like, Faith without works is dead, is essentially what James is getting at. Right? Yes. Yeah. And that's what we talked about last night, right? Is, you know, there's this whole thought movement back in the day with guys like Charles Ryrie and Zane Hodges and Lewis Schaefer that said, hey, you can believe on Jesus as your Savior, but never have to confess him as Lord. No. Right? And and, and, and <laughs> our, our pastor touched on that a few weeks ago in Hebrews 6 when you know, we've talked about antinomianism. <clears throat> we talked about the lordship salvation controversy. We talked about free grace theology. We talked about easy believism. It's all the same thing. Yeah, it's just it's different all saying. Names. It's like, um, man, I'm trying the the thought or the the phrase is escaping me, but it's me being able to do whatever I want to do, and still saying that I'm good with God. Yeah. Which is what our society is, right? Oh, I can sleep with whoever I want to sleep with. I can, you know, identify as what I want to identify as. I can, you know, murder children. I can, you know, vote this way or do whatever. And God and I are good because Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Yeah. Right? And we'll quote these verses that Jesus says, and, well, Jesus is a socialist. Jesus is a liberal. Jesus, newsflash. Yeah, no. Jesus wasn't any of that. No. He was not a conservative. He was not a liberal. He was God in the flesh, the incarnation, the doctrine that we talked about last night because it says that he sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. God stepped down into humanity to say, this is what is required of you. Yes. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. I am glad that you're able to be here, kind of take over for Jared for this week. We wish Jared the best. He's not feeling the greatest right now and didn't think he'd be able to sit or even stand for yeah. the podcast. So, Mr. Greg, or <laughs> Mr. Greg, Mr. Greg. <laughs> Mr. Greg, as the junior <laughs> hires used to call you, thank you for filling in. You are uh, a very faithful member of our men's ministry. Anything we ask you to do, you're like, yeah, whatever I need to do to make it go forward. That's kind of yep. your your motto, and, and I'm glad that you're here. So thanks for hanging out. I appreciate the opportunity. Hopefully the conversation will be uh, enjoyable for you. It'll be fun. It'll be we'll fun. We'll make sure it'll, it'll be, be fun. It'll be absolutely fun. We were in, this is the Romans Review. I'm AJ or Adam. He is Greg Schoff. Hi there. Uh, you are a 
just give us a little background on you. You you serve on our board at the church. Yep. You used to teach junior high. Used to just teach give us a, a little bit of background so people can get to know you. I uh, well I've been going to Beacon, I figure, for about over thirty years. Um, we've done quite a few things in the church. Mm-hmm. Um, I've worked in junior high, worked in senior high, worked in the college class for a minute whenever it first started. We taught down in Trailblazers for a while. Which whenever was fifth and sixth grade. Trailblazers right? was first and second grade. First and second. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that was fun. And it got kind of funny because some of the kids we had in Trailblazers in first and second grade, yeah. then they came back around uh, for uh, seventh and eighth grade. So mm-hmm. that was nice. And then when you were in the junior high class, it was actually when I worked here at the church as a youth pastor. So we worked very closely together. Yes, we did. Got to go to a few camps Yes. together, which is... I don't wish on anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody needs to go to camp at least once in their life with a group of kids. Going that they don't to camp know. and being a counselor is is one thing. Being the point person who runs and registers and like you yeah. guys understand that from the junior high class. Like, yeah. trying, man, I well, do not. Thankfully, I had people around me who were because one thing I am not good at is administrative stuff. Yeah. I just that's not how my mind works. Like. That's why my wife does our budget, because she's a spreadsheet person. Yeah. I am not a spreadsheet person. So thankfully, I had some people around me that were really good at that kind of stuff. They could keep everything in line, and I could just answer the questions. That, that was us, Elisa and her list. If you know yep. anything about junior high, you knew she had a list. And for camp, it was multiple lists, but it kept us organized. Uh, yes. We used to joke, it, there was a comic book team, Power and Glory, she go. was the power, and I got all the glory. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about Romans 8. Let's talk about Romans 8. You weren't in there last night because you were serving. You were probably doing the, the, I the was graphics, doing the, or were you doing the... Um, I was doing the broadcast for the main service. So you, you were running the show last night. If yeah. you ca- caught our live stream of the, the Wednesday night service in the church... Greg was the man making it happen. Great. Now, you know, so if you have any complaints the about the camera angles, <laughs> you can direct them to him, but yep. he will not listen to him because we don't ask for opinions. Nope. We'll just invite you to come up and we'll train <laughs> and you how to do yeah, it. There you go. Yeah, we're <laughs> always looking for better. volunteers. Yeah, you can make it better. There you go. That's a great response. Way better than my response. Way better than my response. Hey, you don't like it? Come volunteer and do it better. Come on. Mine is, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I care, but I challenge Which you, do better. has also been pretty consistent, I feel like, in yeah. uh, the work that we've done together. Yep. So, yeah, Romans 8. So you got to watch it through the video. What What were some things that you kind of took away? Um, well, the biggest thing is I did appreciate the emphasis on uh, verse 1, yep. where there's no condemnation. <clears throat> And I appreciate the fact where you've got it set where there's this giant trial going on Mm -hmm. and you can see Paul where he's making these arguments about what's going on. And whenever you get to the beginning of chapter eight, he summarizes everything that he's worked Mm -hmm. for in those first chapters. And he goes, because of what I've said, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Goosebumps starting there because it's just it's that awesome. Yeah, I feel like, and that kind of goes back to what we talked about with kind of not jamming chapter 7 into one week, though we kind of did jam chapter 7 into one week, but, you know, coming off a six-week break, I don't think there's really a better place to start. Yeah. It's maybe the most pivotal verse of the entire book itself, right? It's, like you said, a summary of everything that he has said. And you've already set it up where this whole chapter, I mean, we're talking... I think if I remember how you described it, it's four weeks worth of stuff. It is. And you're looking at this first part, and it's like, well, there's eight verses. There can't be much there. Just verse one, whenever you start on, and that was part of the other stuff I enjoyed, is where you started unpacking that and pulling it back around to the whole, it is finished. Yeah. And I'm probably going to murder those Greek words, okay. so I won't even try. <laughs> to tell us die. To tell us die is to the tell Greek us verb, yes. finished. Yes. Yeah. Um, but... So I, from my perspective as someone who, who teaches that, like, I always ask the question of why, right? Why is there no condemnation? Well, there's no condemnation because it's finished. So let's talk about that. Yeah. Right? I, I felt that was important to, to kind of tie together. Yeah, it was, it was quite powerful. 
To um, telestai. That's yeah. the Greek verb. A perfect tense verb that does not exist in English. That was that was odd because we're used to I mean, if you paid attention in English class, you have your verbs, you know, you've got past, you've got present, you've got future, and then they can throw the participles and all that other craziness around. Mm -hmm. But this, that aorus tense, and then this perfect tense, it's like, I'd have hated to be a kid learning Learning my native Greek. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, because it's like, what tense are they using? But, But it's so important when you study the Greek language, which is what our Bible is written in, right. that you know those tenses, because if you don't, then you can misinterpret an entire word, an entire section, right? Yeah. Like, if if we just understood that it was finished at the cross, okay, that's great, that's a past event, but to understand in the perfect tense that it is also continuing to be finished, That's right? the powerful part. That, right, there. right. It's, you know... That's, that's the part where you sit there, and whenever you read that, and you realize, and somebody brings it to your attention... That's one of those aha moments where you're just like, oh, yeah. and yeah. then you start fitting in and you start plugging in the goodness of God and how he's had this all planned out. Mm-hmm. And just the word that you use to describe it conveys the fact that, yes, it's done back there. It continues to be done. It's right. a process. And, you know, nobody can ever go through, take that, any of that back. None of it. Yeah. It's, Yeah. <laughs> I, so I hope that that's what's what, that's what was conveyed. Yeah. Right. That there's no condemnation because we were rendered faultless by the sacrifice of Christ back then, but we are continuing to be declared righteous yeah. because it is finished. Yeah. Like that's a that's a big deal. Yeah. And why we spent so much time on <laughs> chapter chapter eight verse one because yeah. it was such a. Yeah. I, yeah. I. Uh, one so Lutheran theology. One of my good friends, he's a Lutheran pastor, and uh, he's a chaplain with me. And one of our soldiers got him a shirt that has Martin Luther's face on it, and it said, "I've got ninety nine problems, but Romans eight one." <laughs> <laughs> Nice. If you catch the Jay Z reference, it's a very great redemptive aspect of uh, of that. And and he gave it to us. He gave it to him at drill, and he held it up, and we just we lost our minds. We just started. All you chaplains had fun with it. (laughs) Like everybody's looking at us, and we're like, "It's a chaplain thing." Yeah, it's a chaplain thing. You You wouldn't get it. it, (laughs) Yeah. Oh. So. Keep the conversation going here. What what are some other thoughts that that um, the uh, the appreciation for how the law just straight up cannot save us? Whenever I was in school, mm-hmm. um, I had the privilege of going to a private school, mm-hmm. and a lot of this kind of stuff was taught. One of the things they always pointed out is the law was more of what they called a schoolmaster. Yeah. It was designed to teach us how we didn't measure up. Mm-hmm. And the law was supposed to be perfect so that we could never achieve that in and of ourselves. Right. And then that's whenever you got to the next part of chapter 8 where uh, I'm... God did what the law yeah. could not... Do. Yeah. yeah, where, yeah. Chapter 2. Yeah. Set you two free in Christ four. Jesus, mm-hmm. yeah. And that was... That's really amazing, too. Now you started getting into... The other words, the propitiation and expiation, and again, that's something that you know most people. That's not something that you hear thrown out on a regular basis. Right. So it's good to have that explanation as well. Well, and it, we talked about it in chapter three because the word propitiations in you know uh, halasterios is in Romans three twenty four, um, but these verses specifically are are the the expiation, the removal of yeah right because there's no condemnation because that has been removed right yeah for, um, for people now I think the word you'd use is expunged yeah because that's what they sure, talk about now great... where some of these mm-hmm. laws have changed and so people that were convicted of a crime mm-hmm. because the law has completely changed it's no longer a crime what they've done so right. they their record gets expunged. expunged. Yep completely mm-hmm. removed and it's it's beautiful that that yeah. happens that's a that's a that's a very good comparison i think 
And it's just, you know, we get those terms confused, right? When I was teaching Romans 3, somebody, as I was teaching, was like, don't you mean expiation? I go, no. <laughs> I said what I said. <laughs> I think man. I remember that. Yeah, I, you know. And, and and the reason why is is there's, there's, you know, both of them have to work hand in hand for our salvation. Propitiation being the payment for, right? Pro, right. the prefix, being for something, you know, if we were at opposition with God, now we are for God because of propitiation. But then the expiation, like the prefix X, is that out of, right? right? That removal right. from the guilt and the shame and all of that, that that takes place. And, you know, Romans 8, we're three verses into it, and there's <laughs> all of this. And, it's, and that's to me, that was the crazy part. You could have just done the entire, you know, spent the entire time just on verse 1. Yeah, could have. And there was enough stuff to unpack. And then this study would be four years long. Because, <laughs> I mean, in reality, there are portions of this, you know, you could teach chapter 8 for eight months. weeks, months, right? Yeah. Because, you know, as we, as we look forward into chapter 8, right, verses 9 through 17 are going to be, you know, that idea of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Well, that could take two weeks to teach. Yeah. And then if you get into 1830, you look at our effect, Adam's effect of sin on creation itself and the longing that's created within creation for its own yeah. redemption, right? And then verse 28, right? Uh, God works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. You could teach just on that verse. <laughs> Probably one of the most misunderstood right. and misused verses Correct. in the Absolutely. Bible. Absolutely. And then from that flows what a lot of scholars and what we're going to teach as the golden chain of salvation for those whom he foreknown. He he predestined and he loved and he called and he glorified, right? And and so you could teach just on those verses. And then, you know, so I mean, yes, you could take much longer than the 35 or 36 weeks yeah. that we're taking. I feel like 36 is a good <laughs> good amount of time because, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's this book. I mean, if you look at Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he has a commentary set on Romans I think is like probably 12 volumes long. My. Right? You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. No, we're touching it at 36. You know, You have a family member who's in ministry who is also a good friend of mine. And him and I have been talking because he taught Romans for like two years, right? We also had a ladies Bible study that did Romans in like six weeks. So it's like yeah. you could teach it for however, and it would still really, one, scratch the surface, but two, you know, you could get something different applicable to your life as the Spirit illuminates that Scripture for you because this book is just so... Well, and that's why you've got the study named the purest gospel because this, the Romans were more of a legalistic to type be, people. To be clear, though, Martin Luther called it the purest well, gospel. I just stole it from you him. Just stole, okay, credit where credit is due. It's still a good title. <laughs> he's yeah, he's dead and gone and celebrating with Jesus. But yeah, I took it from him because yeah. you think about it, right? We have the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of John. We don't have a Gospel of Paul. No, because. As Paul is writing to these churches, these are churches that he has established, yeah. except for Romans. He's not been to this church. So it's a great opportunity for him to be like, okay, I want to come and see you, and because I'm coming to see you, here's everything that you need to know. <laughs> right? Yeah. It, it's like this theological treaty on the gospel itself, and it's, I mean... Chapters 9, 10, and 11 are about to get really crazy because it's, here's how God really worked in his sovereignty and salvation through Israel and now the church and for all people. Like, it is solely the gospel. Yeah. It's, I love it. I love it. Any questions or thoughts? or? No, not questions. Like I said, it was just... The biggest thing I caught from last night, too, was sitting in the main service mm -hmm. and you had pastor John and he's going through James and he's talking about the way to avoid quarrels and how to protect your heart mm -hmm. and how to shape all that. And then we've got here in Romans where we're talking about, you know, whose side are you on? Are you on God's side? Or are you on you know yeah. the world side? And you really can't, you know, you get um, karate kid. 
Walk yeah. left side of road, <laughs> safe. Walk right side of road, safe. Walk middle of road, quick, like great. You know, there's that. And then over in the ladies' Bible study. Never seen the Karate Kid, by the way. <laughs> no, nobody but, has. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not a good movie. But according to How I Met Your Mother, the William Zapka is actually the yes. hero of that movie. <laughs> I've but, seen that. It but, made me laugh pretty well whenever they show up with that. And then for the ladies' Bible study, they're talking about how to guard their hearts yeah. as well because it's... You know, you've got to set those good boundaries and you've got to remove those toxic relationships mm-hmm. from your life. So right. even though it's three different parts of scripture, it's cool how everything all meshed into, you know, it's the same thing. Yeah. You know, basically pick your side mm-hmm. and, you know, sanctify yourself daily, which you're, you're, that's another word I'm going to goof up that anti Antinomianism. Yeah, that right, one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Starting to sound like Arnold Schwarzenegger whenever you say it. That's okay, but uh, but it, it's you bring up something that's interesting is that you know setting our mind on the flesh or setting our mind on the spirit, right? Yeah. And this idea of carnal Christianity, or you could say American Christianity <laughs> in some cases. You said it this time, not me. I, hey, you know, but but, but it is true, right? I mean. Is specifically in our society today where it's, I feel this way. Yeah. I identify this way. Jesus is a God of love. You're right. He is. But he also called sinners to repent. My, my parents, I knew, loved me. Right. But yet there were times whenever I messed up, mm-hmm. I had to get punished for it. And that deepened the love because they had set boundaries for me. And I knew where those boundaries were. And I knew there was a penalty if I crossed that boundary. Do you think it goes too far to ask the question of, like, is a God worth serving that doesn't require transformation? Is that, like, too far of a question to ask? No. Because, like, I sit here and think, you know, American Christianity, society, and all that, and it's like, me and God are good because I choose to do this and, you know, whatever. But it's like, no, you're not. Like, not not the God of the Bible. No. Like, and if, if that's who you want to be good with, then there are certain things that you need to transform. Well, and whenever you look at everything that he's done for us, I mean, just the very fact that he sacrificed his son, Mm -hmm. and you're just going to be like, yeah, that's cool, God. You know, okay, so I'm going to go off and do whatever I want. Thanks, bye. Yeah. No. Yeah. You're. Whenever somebody gives me a gift like that, Mm -hmm. I'm going to do what they ask me to do. Which, again, that kind of goes back to what we've been hearing about in James, where it's, you know, what is it, uh, show me, you know, your, your, your you know, the faith yeah. and the mm-hmm. works, and, and I'm going to get it all convoluted around. But You say I have faith. Yeah. You know, I say I have work. Right. Show me your faith, and I'll show you. Yeah. yeah. So. Like, faith without works is dead, is essentially what James is getting at. Right? Yes. And yes. that's what we talked about last night, right, is, you know, there's this whole thought movement back in the day with guys like Charles Ryrie and Zane Hodges and Lewis Schaefer that said, you can believe on Jesus as your Savior, but never have to confess him as Lord. No. Right? And and and, and our, our <laughs> pastor touched on that a few weeks ago in Hebrews 6 when, you know, we've talked about antinomianism. <clears throat> we talked about the Lordship Salvation Controversy. We talked about free grace theology. We talked about easy believism. It's all the same thing. Yeah, it's just it's different all saying. Names. It's like, um, man, I'm trying the the thought or the the phrase is escaping me, but it's me being able to do whatever I want to do, and still saying that I'm good with God. Yeah, which is what our society is, right? I can sleep with whoever I want to sleep with. I can, you know, identify as what I want to identify as. I can, you know, murder children. I can, you know, vote this way or do whatever. And God and I are good because Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Yeah. Right? And we'll quote these verses that Jesus says, and that, well, Jesus is a socialist. Jesus is a liberal. Jesus, newsflash. Yeah, Jesus no. wasn't any of that. No. He was not a conservative. He was not a liberal. He was God in the flesh, the incarnation, the doctrine that we talked about last night because it says that he sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. God stepped down into humanity to say, this is what is required of you. Yes. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Upon those two things hang all the commandments. And some of the most difficult things to do. But those two things 
to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength requires transformation. Yes. Why? Because there's none righteous, no, not one. There is no one who seeks him, as Paul says in Romans 3, 10, and 12. And we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And oh, by the way, in our section of Scripture, Romans 8, 5 through 8, he says, if your mind's set on the flesh, then and all this stuff that feels good to you and what you want to do, it's impossible to please God. Yeah. So if you want to fulfill the commandments, then your mind has to be set on the Spirit. It cannot be set on the flesh. And this whole idea of a carnal Christian or someone who doesn't have to submit to the Lordship of Jesus as their Savior is heresy. Yes, I agree. It's a problem. It's a big-time problem. Um, thoughts on the hypostatic union and, and the doctrine of the incarnation that we talked about a little bit, you know, last night. That's that's some powerful stuff there, too. Um, now you go off into history, and Correct. a lot of the history stuff that probably people have no clue what it is. So I thought that was that was good. But you have to have it where God has to be fully human and yet fully God at the mm -hmm. same time. Yeah. And yet people, well, that can't be. Well, that's okay because you're trying to put God in this tiny little box right. <laughs> and God doesn't fit your yeah. box. God exists outside your box and God created your box. <laughs> so, you know, he breaks all those rules. Yeah, he does. And, and the the Chalcedonian Creed, we didn't talk about the Creed. We just talked about the background of the Creed and kind of summarized the Council of Chalcedonia um, at, at, that occurred in 450 A.D. Um, and through that Creed, we get the idea that God was fully man and fully God at the same time, which is known as the hypostatic union. And I don't know if our guys um, appreciate it. I'm sure that they appreciate it because I've heard, had a number of them text me, but... I told him last night, I'm never going to shy away from kicking you into the deep end of the pool, right? Because I feel like it's important when we talk about verses like he, by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh, Yeah, that's a very pivotal, doctrinally sufficient verse to understand like God himself stepped down into humanity for our sake. Right. For our good and his glory, Romans 8, 28, which we're going to get to, yep. right? So how does that affect the way, then, that we set our mind on the flesh or on the spirit? Yeah, and you have to set it on the spirit. I also appreciated, too, where you brought in Philippians 2, mm -hmm. 5 through 8, which is one of my favorite sections of Scripture, where, you know, even though... He's God, he, you know, became as a man, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, made himself of no reputation, took upon the form of a servant, was mm -hmm. made in the likeness of men. It, Paul's amazing where he can take and describe yeah. so many difficult concepts and crunch them down into two or three he's verses. Really good. And yeah. you're going, oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's such a fantastic writer. Yes. And nothing that, and I've said this plenty of times, I think, in the, the Roman study, but he 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 um, he kind of takes the Hemingway approach long before Hemingway existed, right? Uh, Hemingway always said, like, how do I get started? I write one true sentence. Yeah. Right. And I feel like that's what Paul does every time he chooses, like, what sentence to write. Like, he use, you know, he uses therefore a lot, <laughs> which is which is impactful. It's like okay. Yeah. This occurs because of this, and that occurred because of this, right? And it just, this this whole thing, as we've been looking from chapter 1, verse 18, all the way through chapter eleven thirty six, is one massive argument. Yeah. Yes, it's broken into chapters for us. It wasn't for the Romans. No, it wasn't. But, like, it's just one massive, and just to think, like, in the the little bit of writing that I've done, and you know the writing that I do for these lessons, like just to have the the continuity of thought, in order to make sure that that is all sufficiently you know, like acceptable, is like, dude, that's a brain that's like been well blessed. Let's just put yeah. it that way, right? Yeah. I mean, obviously, we know he's supernaturally working under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and, and we believe that to be true, so that it's divinely inspired, but 
Yeah, but true. Yeah. He, I mean, That's... he got he got trained by some of the best guys back he then, did. and so he's got he's got more resources than most folks had to pull on. For sure, absolutely, he did. So, but... which is why you know people make a pretty compelling case that he's also the author of Hebrews. Yeah, I think that Luke wrote it, Paul spoke it. That's my belief because there's a lot. There's like. 56 words that are congruent with Luke's gospel and Acts that are not found anywhere else in the New Testament. Anyways, that's a, that's a, that's a rabbit trail we can talk about. But it, I, I bring up Hebrews because Hebrews 1.3 was, and I've, I've talked about this before, but it's one of those aha moments for me in the same vein of, of like the Christological hymn of Philippians 2 where it's he was the exact imprint of God's character. Yeah. Right? Like, it this is fully God. It's not you know a an imitation of who God is. It's not you know a a portion of who God is. It's the exact imprint. It's the exact nature and character of of God that has stepped down in the form of God the Son. And that's people have always had trouble dealing with the Trinity, oh, and yeah. trying to understand, you know, you've got God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They all exist. They're all separate, but yet they're all one Equal, being. Right. Uh, who was the early church father? Um, Arius? No. Um, Augustine. Oh, yeah. Uh, to un- from our doctrine book, you know, <laughs> to understand the Trinity is to lose your mind. Yes, correct. <laughs> it, yeah, Correct. <laughs> But but to deny the Trinity is, is to, to lose, lose your soul. soul. Yes. Correct. Yes. yes. That's one yes. of the best quotes I've ever come across. It's a great one. It it re- those guys were because one of the things I've learned through, you know, all the study that I've done, specifically when it came to the church fathers, a lot of the writings that we have of them are letters they're writing to people. Yeah. To like, for instance, like Luther, a lot of the stuff that he wrote was to debunk people within the city that, you know, were, were not teaching what the Bible taught. And so they get like, hey, moron, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, well, and you are an imbecile, right? And, and they're using the tools that they had available. You write a letter. Well, whenever you write it down, that can be passed around right. to other people to Correct. read. You yeah. know, I, I used to make the joke in junior high. They didn't have social media. It's no. not like you could pull up face scroll or right. something and, <laughs> and go through and have all this. You know, we don't have, you know, the YouTube and everything There's else. even a website. I'm going to see if I can pull it up. But it's like <laughs> Luther Slams. Or Luther insults. Nice. <laughs> it's like a website of like, yeah, the the Martin Luther insult generator. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, it's 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 funny because you know we put these guys up on a pedestal of like these are the great theologians of church history and they're just kind of like us, right? Like, yeah. hey, don't be an idiot, don't be a moron. All right, if you could take one thing away from Romans 8, 1, what do you think it would be? Wow. I know that's a very loaded question because yeah. there's a lot here. There's but... a lot. Just just the fact that you can, like you said, it's security. There's comfort. Mm-hmm. There is no condemnation, mm-hmm. none whatsoever, right. because you can go through other scriptures. You've been promised that whenever he expunges your record, it's gone. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's... Is it Titus 1, 2 is one of my favorite verses where it talks about, you know, where it says, God, who cannot lie. Right. Yeah. You know, so for all these crazy people, well, name me something that God can't do. Or can he create a rock that he can't look? Well, there's something he can't do. He can't lie. Right. So whenever he tells you that your record is completely clean, if you've believed in Jesus Christ, his yeah. son, then your record is clean. Your record is clean. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ because it is finished and so are we thank you guys for stopping by this has been the romans review podcast of romans 8 1 through 8 he's greg shaw filling in for jared who we hope gets better so feel better buddy yes sir i'm aj check us out live wednesday at 6 30 on our youtube page for week 17 romans 8 9 through 17 we'll see you guys there mm-hmm.